Hey guys, and welcome to episode three of the Unarmed Podcast. This episode is all about the comeback. You know, going into that surgery, I didn't really know what was going to come next in my life. But little did I know then that that surgery was going to be the best thing that could have ever happened to me. You know, I came out of surgery and one thing that I'll never forget is everyone that had showed up to support me. Now, keep in mind that all of my family lives in the Rio Grande Valley. I was in San Antonio, that's a four hour drive from the valley to San Antonio. As soon as my family heard what was going on, they picked up, or I'm sorry, they dropped whatever they were doing, picked up and left. They left. That, that costs money, you know, to be able to put gas, put everybody together, but they did it. And that waiting room was jam-packed with my family and nobody else. And that meant a lot to me. It still means a lot to me because without the support of my family and my close friends, who knows where the hell I would have ended up because that was a big part of me taking that amputation so well. You know, we cried. We we kind of went over the day of the accident. You know, I even, I, I vividly remember being in my room and telling my mom, you know, I always see people off the side of the road that, you know, their tires popped. And, you know, I think to myself, how scary is that? And little did I know that that was gonna happen to me and this is what happened. Like, this is what ended up happening. And we cried and we cried and we cried. But through the tears, there was so much strength. There were still so many smiles and so many uplifting moments for me. Um, and my family and my friends being one of them. I was out of the hospital within three days. It would have been two, but I caught a low fever on the second night, so they had to keep me a third day. And I was out of the hospital in three. There was another girl who had been involved in a car accident and also had her arm amputated just about the same time as me. And the day after my surgery, the surgeon walked in and I was not in my bed. I was sitting in the chair across from my bed because I was tired of being in bed already. And he said, wow, you know, you're up and about already? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm ready to go home. And he was like, you know, I have this other girl. I would love for you to go and talk to her and, you know, kind of show her how you're taking it because she's not taking it so well. Uh, that girl ended up not wanting to talk to me. I don't blame her, uh, but I still think about her and I wonder how she's doing now. So I picked up and left after the third day in the hospital and coming home, I had Daniel in my apartment in this small one bedroom apartment. I had Daniel, I had my mom and I had my dad who all stayed with me. Uh, I want to say for the next week or couple of weeks after I got out of the hospital. And like any mother would, my mom was trying to do everything for me. Clean up around the apartment, make food for me, uh, pick up my hair, try to dress me. And I said, no. I said, I don't want your help. And it's not because I was being bitter or because I was angry that I just had my arm amputated. It was because I knew that if I didn't learn how to do these things now, when the hell was I ever gonna learn? Because my mommy and daddy weren't going to be around all the time after the accident. I needed to figure out right then, right there, how to do these things so that I could become independent and claim back my independence after what had just happened to me. And so that's how it went on. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and say that it wasn't hard because it was very hard. 
things that I had taken for granted before the amputation that you don't even think about. Being able to button your jeans, being able to put your hair in a ponytail, painting your fingernails, being able to put shampoo in your hand from the bottle. You don't think about this shit until something like that happens to you and how sad the little things that we take for granted. And I still take things for granted to this day, even after the amputation, because there are people out there who are in much worse conditions than I am. And I know I take for granted a lot of things that I'm still able to do despite only having one arm. So we, need, we really need to be thankful for everything that we're able to do because you always have to remember that someone out there somewhere is going through a far worse time than you are. And so that was that. I had to relearn everything. I, I lost my right arm and my right arm was my dominant arm. I had to relearn how to write. I had to relearn how to drive. I mean, that one wasn't that hard. I think it was more of a mental aspect, more than a physical one. I was a little terrified to get into a vehicle again, but I needed to get into a vehicle again because I planned to go back to work. I planned to go back to the gym. I planned to have a normal life again. And it wasn't too far long before I got into a car again. I had to go buy a new car. Uh, my truck that I was involved, that I was in, that was involved in the accident was a total loss. So I did have to go get another vehicle. Um, and so that came pretty easy after I got over the fear of just sitting in the car and driving because sitting there, I heard the pop of the tire again, you know, and you were always second guessing if it was going to happen to you again. Um, and how I see it now, how I view it now, you know, God don't punish me for saying this, but I see it as he put me through that test. He won't put me through something like that again. Please, God, don't punish me. Jesus Christ, don't punish me. But that's kind of how I see it now. And that's kind of what helped me get through that one piece of it. I remember not wanting to pass the spot where the accident happened either. You know, eventually Daniel and I traveled back home again and I didn't want to pass through that area and you have to pass through that area to get back to the valley. And I either put my seat down or, you know, I just told him like, don't tell me exactly where it was. I don't want to look, I don't want to turn. You know, there was little things like that that still made me afraid for some reason, I never dealt with the accident the way I probably should have. My mind went into this state of get back on your feet, get back to work, get over it, move on. My mind never told me sit down and cry because you just lost your fucking arm. My mind never told me that. And so that's a big part of why I took it the way that I did. And that's a big part as to why I was able to go back to work a month after my amputation. I was able to get back into CrossFit a month after my amputation because my mind was able to go into this mode that I never thought it would be possible because I'm, I'm a very feel, fearful person. I'm scared of flying. I'm scared of a lot of things. Like I am an anxiety ridden person, but for some reason, my mind took me to a completely different place and it said, go, go, go. There's no time to feel sorry for yourself. There was a point where my parents had already left the apartment and it was just Daniel and Daniel's mother came into town and she stayed with us for a while. And I remember thinking, there's too many people here. There's been too many people here. And I don't, I, I'm not saying that I hated the company. I love the company. You know, we had visitors every single day. My coworkers from Rackspace were coming in 
every single day, bringing us food, bringing us everything we needed. Laura and Lou came to visit, the kids came to visit. Laura and Lou is the family I used to work for. Laura sent over a masseuse so that me and my parents and Daniel could each get a massage. Like everybody was taking such good care of us. At the same time though, I never had a moment to myself. I never had a moment to just sit down and cry by myself. I always had somebody with me, always had somebody with me. And there was this one day where I said, this, this is enough. Like, I, I don't wanna be around you, and that's in regards to Daniel, and I don't wanna be around your mom. I need to get the fuck out of here right now. And I got my keys and, and Daniel was worried. He said, where are you going? I said, I don't know where I'm going, but I need to go. And I left. I didn't know where I was going, if I'm being brutally honest. I didn't know where the fuck I was going. I just knew that I needed to go. And I remember my mother calling me because Daniel called her to tell her and she was so worried that I was going to do something to myself. And that wasn't the case at all. It was just a matter of me needing to get away and be by myself after the accident. And I remember taking myself to a park in San Antonio and I said, you're gonna go to the park, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna cry and you're gonna remember everything and you're gonna feel sorry for yourself because it's okay to feel sorry for yourself. Like, look what you just fucking went through. It's okay to feel sorry for yourself. I went to that park, I sat on the bench, and I kid you not, I tried to cry and nothing came out. I tried, I tried, I closed my eyes, I relived that accident in my head, I relived all the good people that had been coming to me afterwards, and I didn't cry. I couldn't, I couldn't cry. And a big part of it was, you're still here. You're still alive and look at all these good people that are here for you. Why do you wanna cry about that? Be happy about that, be grateful for that, be thankful for that. And I got up from that bench, I got back in my car and I drove to a store and I went shopping. I went shopping for clothes. I said, you're a new woman, you need a new wardrobe. More so, I needed easier clothes to fucking put on. I didn't want to be struggling with jeans anymore. I went and bought myself a shit ton of dresses. Um, but that's how it was. You know, I didn't want to be sad about it. I didn't want to let my mind go to such a bad place when it didn't have to go to a bad place because of how... Everything was going in my life. Everything was going so good. And it took time for me to do my hair again. Uh, my hair, that's a big one, man. My hair, I had really long hair at the time. Really, really long hair. My hair was my everything. Like being able to take the curling iron and curl my hair, like that was my thing. I felt confident when I did my hair. I felt beautiful when I did my hair. And I tried to do my hair again and I couldn't. I couldn't, you know, I always used two. I used one hand to, to fit the hair around the curling iron. I used the other one to move the curling iron. Like I, I needed two hands and I could not for the life of me figure out how to work the damn curling iron with one hand. To this day, I still can't perfect the damn curling iron. And I remember we were going to go out one day. My mom and dad were still there. It was going to be me, my mom, my dad, my Daniel. I'm my Daniel. <laughs> he is my Daniel, but Daniel. Um, we were going to go somewhere. I don't remember where we were going, but I wanted to get dressed. I wanted to put on makeup. I wanted to do my hair. And I had a mirror that I would sit in front of. I would sit on the floor and I would sit in front of the mirror. And that's where I would do my hair and my makeup. And I sat there. And... I looked in the mirror and I never picked up the curling iron because I knew how frustrated I was going to get. And I knew that whatever I was about to do to my hair was not going to be what I wanted it to look like. And my mom walked in on me and she said, let me help you. I said, no. She said, let me help you. 
And so she sat down and she did my hair and I did my makeup. And even though she was doing my hair for me and she was doing a great job with my hair, I still didn't feel satisfied. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel pretty. And I walked out of the room. This was probably the first time that I had done my hair and my makeup since the accident. And I was wearing a nice dress and everything. And I walked out of the room and Daniel's face just lit up. He lit up because I hadn't put that much effort into myself in, in, in a while. Or in the, you know, the few weeks or whatever it took for us to get out of the house. And not even that made me feel happy or pretty. I felt so defeated not being able to do my own hair. Shit, man, it makes me emotional, but it's true. Like not being able to, to do something so simple hurt me. It hurt me because it was so easy before and it wasn't easy anymore. But shit, man, I worked my ass off to get through things like that to, to get me where I am today. Whether it be doing my hair, buttoning the buttons on my shirt, like little things like that. I worked my ass off every single day to perfect it and to build my confidence back up again. Because if I sat here and tell you that I didn't lose confidence after losing my arm, that'd be a complete fucking lie. I lost so much confidence and I was so afraid that Daniel was going to leave. I should have ever been afraid that he was going to leave, but I was. I was scared that he was going to leave because we had only been dating a few months. He didn't need to stay for this. He didn't need to go through this. He didn't need to be with me, but he did. But I was scared that I was going to lose him because I looked this way. And that's probably pretty mean to say, and he'd probably get mad at me for saying that because he would say, how dare you think that of me? But that is how I thought. And I, I just lost a lot of confidence in myself. I didn't see myself the same. I couldn't go into bars again that easily. I couldn't have fun as easily because I knew people were staring. I knew people were looking and I knew people were whispering behind my back and it just wasn't the same anymore. But just because people were staring and whispering behind my back, I still did those things. I made myself go out to the bars and have fun with Daniel, go out to parties, do this, do that. I made myself do that. It was a work in progress for me and it was very hard work for me, but I did it. I did it so that I could still feel normal and live that normal life that I wanted. I went back to work not knowing what was going to happen because my job entailed a lot of typing. It, to tell you the truth, it was nothing but typing. And I said, what the hell am I going to do now? Like I was a fast typer with two hands. And... I love my employee, not my employees, my coworkers that I had at Rackspace. I love them and I miss them. I went back to work and one of, he wasn't even my manager. He was kind of a mentor for our team. He introduced me to this software that you put into the computer and it teaches you to type with only a certain amount of keys. And it was the keys that only, you know, the left hand could reach. And he, they didn't let me work when I first got there. They said, you don't have to work. Don't, you know, go into what we did. They said, just familiarize yourself with everything again. And so for the first few days, I got familiar with that software. And that guy even showed me a game to play. It was a kitty typing game that they show you in like fucking middle school. It's like this game where this gun is shooting out letters and then it upgrades you to words and you have to type them as fast as you can. He's like, play this game, get good at this game. And until you get good at this game, 
then you can go back to work. So I was there clocking into work to go fucking play this game, but I played it and I played the shit out of it because I wanted to get back to work. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me or keep me at my job just because I lost my arm. I wanted to do what I was supposed to do. I didn't want to be getting paid money to play a game. I wanted to be getting paid money to do my job. And so after I graduated from that game, I did go back to work. I'm not going to sit here and say it was easy because it wasn't. It was very discouraging to be so slow at something that I was so fast at. You know, I used to be able to take a ton of chats. A lot of what I did was chat online with our customers. I used to be able to take multiple chats and talk to people on the phone at the same time. And it got to a point where I had to either shut off the chat or shut off the phone because I couldn't multitask the way that I used to anymore. And that hurt me and it discouraged me. But what helped me get through that was going back to the gym. I think I was more fearful of going back to the gym than I was going back to the actual office and going to work. So the thing about CrossFit, I mentioned it before, is that CrossFit, the place that I went to, was a part of Rackspace. It is what Rackspace offered to its employees. It was literally right outside the office. And I was also coming off of pain medication. I made sure that I came off that heavy pain medication before I went into work. And even though I left that pain medication before I left to work, I had the worst withdrawals. Withdrawals? Withdrawals? Yeah, withdrawals from that medication. It was bad. As if I was a fucking drug addict. It was so bad. I would wake up in the morning in cold sweats, shivering, trembling. I would be at my kitchen table before I had to go to work and I was shaking. And I felt like I needed to vomit. I was so nauseous. And Daniel was like, what's wrong? And it didn't hit me until later that I was going through withdrawals. And it sucked. It sucked so bad. So for the first you know, few days that I had gone to work, I didn't go to CrossFit because I was going through really bad withdrawals from all that pain medication that I was put on. And after I was good from that, I decided to go back to CrossFit. And I went in just thinking I need to get my endurance back. That's all I want right now. I don't need to lift weights. I don't need to figure out the hard shit. I just want to get my endurance back. And so I walked in that first day and everyone was there waiting for me and waiting to greet me and ready to wad. And I walked in and I talked to one of my coworkers and one of my friends there at CrossFit, his name was Davila. And he, you know, I told him, I said, I just, I just want to run, you know, cause I knew running would pick up my endurance again. So we did that. I, I want to say I put on a, a small weighted vest and I ran and I couldn't even complete a fucking lap. And that killed me. And so every day after that, I went back and every day I ran a little more. And every day I tried something new that I was going to have to adapt, whether it was a deadlift, a snatch, a clean, a kettlebell swing. Every day I did something new and every day I was determined to do it better and better and better. And as I kept going in CrossFit and as it started raising an even bigger fire in me, it started degrading the fire that I had to keep working that job where I was chatting with people and basically doing sales. So for a while, I wasn't very interested in the actual job. I went to work because CrossFit was there, but I wasn't happy about working. I wasn't happy about chatting. I remember going up to the head coach at the CrossFit box and asking him because he was also um, like the head honcho of, of wellness and health and exercise as a whole at the company. And I went up to him 
his name was Dan. I went up to Dan and I asked him, is there any, you know, way that I could maybe get a position here with you doing something with you like coaching crossfit doing something because i was so heavily involved into crossfit after the accident crossfit gave me a ton of confidence crossfit showed me the strong woman that i had inside me all along crossfit pulled more out of me than anything in this life ever could have crossfit saved me and I was so heavenly involved in it that I went on to go get my level one certification. Like I was hardcore into this sport. I was so thankful for it. I was so grateful for it. And I wanted to give my life to it. And so I asked him if there was any way I could get a position. And he said, you know, there's no open positions because really they don't even give us a very nice budget to work with in the first place. And and so I tried with him weeks and weeks and he tried too to see if they could open up a position and they just wouldn't budge. And it was very discouraging for me because this sport was my everything at the time. And I wanted nothing more than to keep being a better athlete and, and just leave the job that I wasn't happy with anymore. And it's funny or maybe i should save that story for a different yeah i'll save that story for a different one i was about to say something but i'm going to save that um and so that's how we went for a while and I, I still went to to work i still did what i have to do i wasn't very good at what i had to do you know the i had to get leads and i wasn't getting very many leads um but i didn't really care because my heart was into CrossFit and that's the sport of CrossFit. Because like I said, it saved me. It really saved me. I saw that if I can do this shit with one arm, what can't I do? Like I can do anything I want if I can accomplish what I'm accomplishing here. And that's how we went for, until this day. You know, that sport gave me all the confidence in the world. And I'm not saying CrossFit is going to give you all the confidence in the world. But I will say to find something in this life that brings you such joy and happiness that it, it just gives you all that confidence you need. Find something like that. Find something like that for yourself because that right there is so powerful and so meaningful for you in this life. Find something that makes you happy. Find something that makes you feel confident. I don't know where I would be right now without that sport. I mean, I gave my heart to it. I would do all these lifts. I even competed three months to the day, three months after the accident. I went and signed up for my first, actually I signed up for my second. So the first CrossFit event that I ever signed up for I mentioned it in another podcast, was going to be an all-girls competition. I was going to do it with all the girls there at our box. Um, but then the accident happened, and I wasn't going to be able to compete in that competition. And I didn't. I still went to that competition, and I cheered on all those girls that were a part of our box. I was still there in spirit with them, um, but I did not compete at that competition. I ended up signing up for the Working Wounded Games uh, in Virginia at that time and this competition was a competition that only adaptive athletes could compete in so there was athletes from all walks of life there no legs no arms you know just different different amputations different I hate the word disabilities but different different fucking things going on with them damn it and um that made me excited again you know i was pretty bummed that i couldn't compete and that that made me feel down on myself thinking well shit, you can't compete now because you only have one arm but this other competition gave me hope and i went and i saw videos on it and it just gave me so much hope man like yeah you can still compete you don't have to just wad every day you can actually compete and you can compete with people that are on your same level. And so I flew to Virginia 
I flew with Daniel, my good friend Monica, and my good friend Victoria. And we all flew over there and I competed in my first working wounded games, my first ever CrossFit competition. I made a lot of friends that day that are still my friends to this day. They're gonna be lifelong friends. Um, I made a lot of mistakes during that competition and I learned a lot of lessons in that competition. And that competition, even though I failed miserably and I got injured, set me up for success for the next few years of my life. I went on to compete even more. I went on to PR every single lift and I outdid my numbers that I had done with two fucking arms. When I started CrossFit, I wanted big numbers, just like I'm sure everybody else does. I wanted that big deadlift. I wanted that big clean and jerk. I wanted the big numbers on the snatch, the big numbers on the clean. I wanted those big numbers. And when I first started CrossFit, it wasn't the case, just like it's not the case for every first timer that comes in there. And after I lost my arm, you know, that fire that burned inside me made me want to prove not only myself wrong, but prove any other people wrong that might have been saying, no, you can't do that anymore. Don't tell me I can't do something anymore because I will prove to you that I can do it. And I did. I proved it over and over and over again with my hard work and with the dedication that I had inside of me. When I first started CrossFit, I could barely clean 75 pounds. Four years, yeah, about four years into it with so much practice, with so many hours worth of work put into that, I was able to clean 135 pounds with one arm. 75 pounds with two, 135 pounds with one arm. It just so happened that there was a news station at the box that day that was doing an interview on me. And all the fucking news stations wanted the lifts. That's all they cared about was the lifts. And at that time, I didn't mind. And I said, let me do some cleans for you guys. And so I started doing cleans. They felt really good that day. Uh, my back wasn't hurting, like my form looked good. Everything was feeling really good that day. And I had been working my ass off to try to hit 135. And I mean, it, it worked up. I worked my ass off to hit 90, 100, 110, 115. You know, I worked myself up each time. And I hit 130. I hit either 125 or I hit 130 and it felt really good. I said, I'm gonna go for it. And even though five pounds doesn't sound like much of a difference, it is a big difference. And I think it's more of a mental block than it is a physical one. Like if I tell myself you got five more pounds on there, it'll fuck me up in the head so bad. Like it takes time to get over it mentally, at least for me. So I stood there with that 135 on the barbell and I had to go into my head, forget the cameras were there, forget everyone was around me. And I said, you can do this. You've been working hard. You've gotten through so much in your fucking life. Pick up the damn barbell. And so I got into position. I put my hand where it needed to be because I need to find the center of the barbell now with one arm. I found the center and I attempted the lift and I failed. I tried again and I failed. And I said, you're gonna do it one more time. And I had to give myself cues along the way to help me remember what I'm doing in this lift. Whether it be get on your toes more, open up your hips more, get under the bar faster. Like I had to start giving myself cues because you know the camera crew was kind of ready to move on to the next thing because I was just failing. And I got into position and it worked. I caught the clean, but catching the clean is one thing. Now you have to stand up that barbell because you just caught it in the squat. 
and 135 pounds is heavy. That's heavy. That's no easy feat. Even if I caught it with one arm, it's another thing to be able to lift your legs up with that weight. But I had trained for it. I had been able to squat, front squat, close to 200 pounds. So I knew I could get it up. So I caught it and I slowly picked myself up. And once I reached the top, I let that barbell go and I started crying my eyes out. And one thing I'll never forget, because I fucking hated it, is that this camera crew ran towards me and put the fucking camera in my face like, why are you crying? Why are you crying right now? Can you tell us why you're crying? And I wanted to tell him like, can you fuck off for a moment? Like, this is a big deal for me right now. Like, do you know what I just did? Do you know what I just accomplished? I just fucking lifted 135 pounds with one arm. Do you know how fucking hard I worked to do that? Do you know how long it took me to be able to accomplish that? Four fucking years. Four years. And they just wouldn't leave me alone. And so I, I was there crying on camera. And I hate to this day that I don't have a good video of that lift. I have a video that kind of goes off to the side, but because my friend that was filming it, she was just super excited with me that the camera wasn't center. But um, I wish I had a better video of that lift. That is one of my proudest lifts to this day. And I think that has a lot to say for the way that I've also been for almost six years now. Um, you know, I take these challenges and I work hard at them to accomplish them. I just have to continue setting goals for myself. Even if they are small goals, I have to set some sort of goal for myself because if not what is going to push me in this life if i don't have goals for myself and that's what i did every single day i made a new goal for myself whether it be that the ponytail needed to look a little better than the way it did before whether it be the speed of time for buttoning up my jeans or figuring out a new way to get my back in the shower, get my back washed. Like I always made small goals for myself. I never made, I mean, I, I wanted big goals, but I also knew that making these really big goals for myself at first, I was only gonna bring disappointment to myself. So I made small little goals and I accomplished them a little at a time. And every time I accomplished a small goal, I got closer and closer and closer to getting to the big ones that I really, really wanted. And I got there. You know, there's so much that I regret um, in CrossFit that I did at such an early time. But at the same time, I can't be so regretful of it because it brought me so much joy and it, it proved so much to me. It's kind of a hard situation when I think of stuff like that because I'm in a very different place now than I was before when it comes to CrossFit. Um, it's something that, I, that I've struggled with, but you know what I did then, even though a part of me wants to be regretful of it, a big part of me doesn't want to be regretful of it because it did bring me so much in my life. And... You know, I, I just continue to be like that, even though I don't spend hours in the gym the way that I used to anymore. I have other things to worry about. I have other goals that I've set for myself to accomplish. I'm a mother now. I'm still with Daniel. I'm in a relationship. You know, I we own a house now. We have pets. I have other things to worry about than just being in the gym all the time, but I'm very grateful for all that time that I was able to spend in the gym, for all that time that I was able to be in there working up my confidence and working up my strength, not only mentally, but physically as well. That arm that I lost almost six years ago was a blessing in disguise. If you asked me today, Crystal, would you take your arm back? If there was like some fucking magical way that we could give you your arm back, would you take it? I'd say no. I don't want it. You can keep your arm because I don't want it. And it's not that I don't want the old crystal because I'm the same fucking crystal with just different tweaks in there. Um, but I don't want it. The life that I've been able to live, the people that I've been able to meet, the lessons that I've been able to learn, that's happened to me for a reason. 
it all happened to me for a reason. I may not have known that reason then at the time that it happened, but I know it now. And that was to be able to prove to everyone around the world, including you today listening, that you are capable of doing so much in this life, more than you could ever dream of if you just work at it. There's no room to be lazy. There's no room to feel sorry for yourself. There's only room for you to improve every single day. Keep improving yourself, keep working at your goals, and you will accomplish anything that you set your mind to. That's gonna be it for this episode, you guys. In episode four, I really wanted to dig deep into the next portion of my life where it wasn't so strength-filled and happy-filled. You know, I did go through a depression after the amputation it didn't come quickly when most think it should happen it came pretty far after but i did go through a depression because of the life that i chose to live after the amputation it's, it's confusing but it also makes sense um so in episode four we are going to be talking about the struggle so i hope you guys tune in next week i really hope you enjoyed this episode Please subscribe to the podcast. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.